This is a Stock Trading Reality Podcast, episode 21, where we sit down with a real-life economist. I feel like a little kid. The stock market's going to be there the next day, and if you have the, the right tools, um, you, can, you can play in any kind of market that's out there. This is the Stock Trading Reality Podcast, where you get to see the realistic side of a trader's journey. Get inspired and stay motivated by everyday normal people who are currently on their journey to trading success. And this is your host, whose workout partner is also his IT guy, Clay Trader. Yeah, that may sound a little goofy, but uh, the IT guy who uh, is actually a full-time employee, he's uh, a good friend of mine, so... Part of the job description before he came aboard was, yeah, you got to come, uh, we got to come lift weights with me. So, um, and we actually touched on that in this interview, but our guest today touches on it way at the end, talking about how exercise and all that stuff is actually really healthy for traders. And I fully agree. Uh, and that's kind of cool how that worked out because as traders, especially if you're doing this more of a full time thing, I mean, you, you do, you're, you're sitting at your computer, uh, you're, you're very, um, not moving around a lot, you know, you're not, unless you're doing jumping jacks and stuff like that. So, um, from a health perspective, it's definitely good to get out and exercise. I'm not saying you have to go and lift the weights, but, uh, if you want to get into this business and, and stay healthy, um, then, you know, plan on doing some sort of, uh, you know, exercise and, you know, that sort of stuff. And, uh, you know, Chez who lives in Southern California right now, Nate and I are in, uh, you know, Western Michigan, Grand Rapids, I keep trying to get him to come out and move to, to Grand Rapids or at least Chicago, where he's from, so he can come lift with us. But I think he's scared. Chez, what's your response? Well, you know what? I'm out here in California where I can just go to Muscle Beach, which I you know always frequent. <laughs> they know me on a first name basis down oh, there because nice. I'm so so huge. The Chesinator? Uh, is that what they call you down yeah, there? They pretty much, yeah, yeah. Me and Arnie, you know, we give high fives to each other, and he calls me the Chesinator. It's pretty good. Our 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 old governator. But um, yeah, I I completely agree to the point where. I actually had was getting back pain from sitting in a chair for so long, you know, for the entire market day, and uh, I actually converted my desk into a standing desk, and um, you know, to kind of help out with that. But yeah, you know, you got to be, got to get that blood moving around, and you know, staying physically active is not just good for your health; um, it's good for your brain. You know, it's it's just a, a helpful thing, and it, it really helps de-stress too, especially when it's you know, if you might have some positions on that are really weighing on you. Yeah, and I mean, let's just call it like it is. You will get fat as a trader. Trader is a profession. Will you? It will make you fat because you're just not burning any calories through the day. You're literally sitting at your desk, and not like you know, it's not super unique. I mean, lots of you know, if if you work at a desk job, but it is the total desk job of desk job. You know, even when I worked for Honeywell uh, as an engineer, yes, I had a cubicle, but I'd still be out walking around, you know, out on the floor, you know, talking to operators and stuff like that. But with trading, it's literally not that. You just sit at your desk. So, um, you know, definitely, uh, exercise and, uh, you know, plan on putting that into your, uh, your business. If you want to pursue trading in a very serious way, uh, you're going to want to, you know, get some sort of, uh, like Chess said, it's help. It helps with stress. It helps, you know, just keep your brain functioning. So, uh, you know, keep that in mind. Today's guest is, uh, I was, I was very intimidated by it. And I think I mentioned that in the interview, but, uh, he actually has a PhD in economics for those that are a part of the, the trading group. Arch Steve is what he goes by, uh, his name in the, uh, the chat room. And uh, he, he teaches economics, uh, a very, very bright guy. And it was fun to talk with him. Uh, Chez and I were talking just how much fun we had with the interview uh, and a lot of valuable insights. He's got some really cool um, perspectives from, you know, clinical research and, you know, economic research on, you know, paper trading and, you know, what kind of works, why things do and don't work. So, uh, you know, definitely uh, you know, give this interview uh, a listen to the end because there's lots of good stuff uh, buried all over the place. So uh, I'm excited for it. So let's uh, let's get started. Well, hey, Steve, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. This is fun. Fun to talk to you guys. Yeah, we uh, we've been talking for uh, well, it was funny. Chez shows up. I got a quick eat real quick. Talked with Steve for five minutes. So he's stuffing his face with food and uh, me and Steve. 20 are... minutes ago too. Whoops. <laughs> yeah, 20 <laughs> minutes ago. So uh, Steve and I have been talking and uh, um, just a little background on him. I don't mean to uh, spoil his story, but he does have a, a PhD in economics and he teaches economics and I have an, a minor in economics. So we were both kind of geeking out talking about economics and how great it is. And, uh, so we've, uh, we've talked about quite a bit of that stuff, but, um, you know, we're not here to necessarily talk about economics per se, but if it comes up, that'll be awesome. So Steve, let's uh, just start at the very beginning. I, I'm sure. you're, you're kind of unique because, okay, you're an economics you know, you, that's what you do. So yeah. you've 
clearly known about the markets for a while, but you know, there's a big difference between knowing about the markets yeah. and uh, so let's. What actually even got you interested in wanting to do economics? Sure. What what drew your attention towards okay. the markets in general? All right. So yeah, let me just give you a little background on myself. I I um when I finished college, this is like in '99, so I'm a little bit, a little bit probably a little older than most folks in the room. I don't know. Uh, getting close to 40 here, so we um, got the midlife stuff going on. Anyways, <laughs> I, when I uh, when I got finished with college, I did a lot of stuff overseas. Uh, I worked internationally quite a bit for like 10 years. Um, I lived in Europe for a while and Africa and the South Pacific um, and uh, did a lot of economic development stuff. Uh, my, my background is actually in uh, biology, um, so uh, sort of a science background. And then uh, I, I really got into sort of the uh, policy side of things and, and just sort of economics, um, economic policy. So I decided to go for a PhD in economics, actually, without having really much coursework in economics. And somehow they accepted me into a, a PhD program. Um, but I had always had like a, a basically a, an interest in, in markets. And I remember back in high school, um, I think like a high school economics course, uh, we had to, to pick stocks basically out of a, back then a newspaper, you know, uh, see what, what they looked like. And then what's a newspaper. Do, yeah. I don't even remember. <laughs> it's been so long, but, uh, yeah. So they basically, you pick some stocks out and then like, uh, so maybe at the end of the course it was, um, who, who had done the best a sort of competitive thing. And I had done really well. I remember actually can remember picking a, uh, DuPont uh, stock in that class, and it had done really well. So I was like, "Well, I, I have a you know, I have a, a knack for this." Um, but it, it was one of those things faded, and uh, but it, always in the back of my head, like, "Oh, I need to you know actually learn about the markets and, and the stock market, and and see how that works, and see if I can can do anything there." And um, you know, didn't have much money really for as I was overseas and and even doing my PhD and. Um, but it always had that sort of idea, like oh, I need to get back to that. And then, so as as I started, you know, maybe earning a little bit more and seeing that I had some some money uh, to do something with, I I thought I got to take a look at the stock market a little bit. Um, and as kind of part of, I think it was part of diversification of my my funds, you know. Um, and my wife's uh, friends always used to make fun of me uh, because they would well they would say well you're married to an economist so you're going to be able to manage all your finances so well but you know there's really not a correlation there if you're an economist it doesn't mean that you can manage money i mean there it's not really doesn't really exist so i i kind of always had this little pressure like i need to i need to learn about this stuff so um so i i yeah that's basically how i kind of got into uh thinking about markets um, Oh, I was going to say, Chaz, it just dawned on me. We are. We're speaking with an economist right now. That's, are you intimidated? I just, the intimidation level just picked up. I feel like we have to pay him for this podcast or something. <laughs> yeah. Like, like we, we had to pay, we had to, yeah, do something to get him on because, yeah, this is awesome. <laughs> well, luckily so, it's summer, so I'm just sort of chilling in my, my office here at the university, you know. Yeah, yeah when, he says, when he says at the university, he's at, a, he's at a penthouse somewhere with the helicopter right above him. And yeah, he's pretty much manipulating the markets right now and you know, figuring out where he should be. Yeah, but, you should have um, seen him on cam. He was lighting cigars on fire with $100 <laughs> bills. So, I mean, he's, he's, he's just living the life. I mean, we're talking to an economist. Previous episode, we're talking to a Viking. Now we're talking to an economist. We're, we got all sorts of characters on the show, Chuz. We're all, all across the map. So, so, so now you've kind of, you know, Time has gone by. You still, mm -hmm. you know, obviously you, it, markets are something that um, yeah. you're getting back into. Now, how, what is your approach now for putting on um, a trade? What, what do you, are you just taking like a market outlook and um, just buying stocks? Do you like, how, are you well, stock picking like you did in that class or are you doing something yeah. different? Well, okay. So when I first, the first trade I did uh, was um, I bought Tesla. I actually went back to see um, when I bought it because I, I, I it's been a several years and it was like twenty three bucks I think at the time. Uh, I think I, I look back I think 2010, 2011, somewhere in there maybe when they first went on the market because I was kind of interested in electric cars and uh, I actually have an electric car. Uh, Mitsubishi has, has a, a electric car. With, they're really fun to drive actually. Uh, accelerate like crazy. You wouldn't you wouldn't think, but um, yeah, the electric really motors cool. are very very torquey. They're awesome. Yeah, you don't have to wait for the the pistons to fire. I guess. I mean, I don't know anything about mechanics, but that's what I've heard. You're an economist. And, You're good. Yeah, Just keep exactly. on rolling, okay, man. Good. 
So I bought those Tesla uh, shares. I think I bought like six of them. You know, I, I mean, I was I'm pretty risk averse here, so I like bought like a handful of Tesla shares, and uh, they went up to like forty bucks. And I was like, oh, I've got to sell half of them. So I sold half of them, um, and then I was like, wow, I, I can do this. Like I know I know what I'm doing here. And so um, then I, I got busy with my still still working on my PhD at the time. So I, I think I kind of just let those sit there. I was kinda, it was my strategy just to kind of buy these stocks and and you know they're gonna they're gonna go to the moon so I, I might as well hold on to them and um, uh, so I was I was doing pretty good and te- I, you know the story with Tesla it's gone up so I had like my three or four shares that were going up and um, then I uh, then I sort of had a little bit of extra uh, change I think even in my trading account. I don't know where it came from. I, I went to check on it one day. It was like a summer. I think I can tell you exactly. It was summer of 20, uh, 2013. So just a couple years ago. And I um, was just looking around and I had remembered a friend of mine. In, actually, when I lived in Sweden in uh, 20, it was 2001, I, was, I uh, lived in Sweden and a Canadian, two Canadian friends of mine talked about fuel cells. And they said, oh, that's a great, great stock. To, uh, to, you know, great, those are great companies to get into. So I had that extra change. And I was like, oh, I remember about the fuel cell thing. So I just went to look and um, I started reading about uh, Plug Power. And uh, their, their shares were like 10 cents. And I, and I looked at the chart. And if you go back, it's like, wow, it had been at like $1,300. Actually, back in 2011 or 2001, when I f- first heard about fuel cells, I guess they were like above $1,000 according to the chart, you know. And uh, there was a lot of press coming out. I was like, wow, this is like the perfect time to buy plug power. So I, I bought, um, you know, I put those pennies basically that I had into uh, 100 plug power shares, um, which were below, I think it was like 10 cents at the time. Um, and so I kind of sat on those. And then in, in like November, I went back and checked. This is like the summer. And I, like in a few months later, I went back and checked. And like, wow, they've gone up to like a buck 20 or something. And um, so I sold those last Tesla shares that I had, and I, I bought more plug, um, and and things really started heating up. And like, wow, this is you know I was getting I was getting a lot of confidence here, and it, my account was looking pretty good. Um, and so I I actually figured it out that I could do a margin account with uh, uh, Ameritrade, and um, so I started racking it up and uh, got my brother into it, and you know he bought some plug. And uh, things were, were going great, and um, I think it peaked out in like March. Um, you have a, I think you have a video of that day that it just crashed like crazy. Plug power. I remember doing, yeah. I mean, I remember doing the video analysis on it. That was a that was a crazy move, and you got in that thing at ten cents. Yeah, I did, um, but I kept getting in. That was the problem. Ah, so you kept averaging yeah, and up I didn't, and averaging up. And yeah, and the reason why was uh, well, the, the, my strategy here was look at the chart. Go back; it's, it was up to like you know twelve hundred bucks. That I thought it was about to head back there. You know, that's <laughs> so. I mean, you bought a so stock for- at this point. I can't even yeah. believe I'm telling you this. <laughs> I sh- don't. I mean, this no, it's be, totally no. It's, hey, hey, I, yeah. I mean, I invested in a. Pe- a muffler company that was a penny stock, and I thought I was yeah. going to become a millionaire yeah. on a p- muffler company. So trust me, I, I set the yeah. bar as low as it can get. Uh, <laughs> so it's safe to say that you you did you think you had it all figured out? You thought, yeah. wow, oh, yeah. I this stock trading thing. Uh-huh. Or did, did you call it trading, or did you think you were a sophisticated no, no, I, investor? I, 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 was invest, I was investing. Yeah, I was oh, okay. investing, and and I I was like, wow, I've you know my I think that. I really that initial investment. I ended up, you know, pulling out a few more, a few more, bit of more money out in, from other things in there. I, I think I ended up investing a couple thousand bucks, and that couple thousand turned into like twenty grand. I mean, it was it was looking pretty good, you yeah, know? know. And but I, I basically lost all of that. So I saw it go. I mean, it was like in a day. It went from like you know uh, twenty twenty grand down to you know well below that. I mean, it dropped. Go back and look at Plug Power. I mean, you know, it went Chaz, like, or do you have a chart up, Chaz? Yeah, I mean, it had had like uh, more than fifteen or something. Yeah, it had just had a huge drop, like a seventy percent drop in one day or something. It's just yeah. ridiculous. So is yeah. is that the time that that seventy percent drop? Is that when your kind of fool's gold bubble all all of a sudden got a little bit tarnished and thought, yeah. wait a second here. Yeah, yeah, it it's, did, it, it okay. did. But um, but uh, to tell you the truth, I I um, I think I was learning a lot, even even though I was, um, you, you know, seeing that that decline or, or just seeing that I, I was making mistakes. I, I was learning a lot and I, I actually really enjoyed the process. 
Um, so I, another reason why I guess I started getting into stocks is because a lot of students a lot of times ask about stock market. So from a practical uh, work perspective, I, I just wanted to have a better handle on what what's kind of going on. So I was learning a lot about that, and I think it's probably a really. I mean, everyone probably should lose fifteen grand. Um, uh, but the good thing was that wasn't like 15 grand out of my account. It was what had gone up and then back down. So at least, um, I mean, actually, I think I still was, I was still pretty, I mean, I was profitable to a degree, but I, I saw, uh, how you can really get, um, you know, over your head and thinking that this thing's going to the moon. And that, that is just so true. Like if you see, if you have a good winner like that, then man. So, so it was good. Those were all good, really good lessons. I, I don't, I don't feel I didn't lose my house or anything. So, um, or really, you know, maybe a little bit of uh, uh, just kind of, you know, you feel stupid. <laughs> That's about it. So that was so I was lucky. But I mean, a lot of people have, you know, people lose big amounts. I'm sure you, you probably know about, obviously know that more than I do. Um, so, anyways, I, I just decided I really needed uh, at that point to get a bit more training and um so i think i probably joined you clay trader shortly after uh that drop <laughs> you might see when i i don't know when i joined actually uh sometime that spring though um 2014 and right. uh so it was i mean that you you got you just sort of the real reality is you need some education so um that's what that's kind of where i you know that was how i learned that Right now, now while I don't agree with um, our buddy here that you should lose fifteen grand, like you said, they, that was that was you know unrealized on paper. Um, he's not yeah. the first person to kind of watch a big gain come back down and you know either become a loss or you know you make a little bit versus making a lot. But um, but you know that that's that's usually uh, what happens to a lot of people, and especially if you kind of find early success. I've never actually had that happen. I just got mm -hmm. slaughtered right out of the gate. Actually, I guess Bitcoin was okay, but I got slaughtered for the most part more than anything. Um, but yeah, you know, you had to, you had that that moment where you realize, you know, you could be better equipped to um, you know to compete in these markets. And um, now, did you have? Did you just look at candlestick charts and think, you know, I'd like to be able to read them better? Did you, or were you, did you ever kind of look and say, I'm going to learn how to read, you know, these fundamentals and talk about PE ratios or anything like that? Yeah, I think um, I bought a, a. Maybe you've seen this book. Um, I don't know if you want me to mention a book name, but I bought a. Go I bought for a it. book. I think it was Top Stocks. Um, there's a. You probably you must have seen it. Top Stocks. I think is what it's called. Um, but some guy in Florida, uh, basically, um, was trying to to explain his method of uh, finding out. Um, oh, I don't know. Oh, on weekly charts and looking at weekly charts, and then also thinking about these PE ratios and things like that to to pick these big winners. So I was still in the mindset, I guess, of I'm going to find these winners that will then shoot to the moon. I mean, that's that that's what I thought the the end game should be. Um, but then I, I so that's that was kind of my progression, I'd say. Um, and, and then I realized that there's there's so many other strategies out there. Um, and and so I'm, yeah. I'm 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 assuming that this this book that you bought. That what this guy was trying to explain. I mean, it, it wasn't quite the Holy Grail system that. He... Uh, no, and, and actually, I, I I started reading it and I realized that that, that was, you know, it just wasn't it wasn't my approach really. I didn't I didn't think that I didn't believe in it. So I actually didn't. I don't think I finished the book. Um, sort of on my shelf, dusty. You know, it it wasn't. So okay, so this is a this is a great plug for Clay here. I mean, just that uh -oh, interactive. Here we go. Let's go, well, Chaz. Everybody, be quiet. Plug coming. Stuff. Yeah, here we go. Um, I hate to use the word plug. Actually, I, it's kind of a not a good yeah, one. Was that a, was that uh, a pun it, intended? Yeah, yeah. I, guess, well, I guess it wasn't. But uh, um, but yeah, just that sort of the interactive part of it. Like it, just reading a book, it just doesn't do it for me on on something like this. Uh, you need to you need to actually be doing you know like seeing charts move and 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 having. Um, I need to have a, like a systematic strategy that. You know, that just is easy to do, easier to do. I can't, I won't say easy, but you have to put the time in. But it, it, it just it was, it just it was easier for me to understand charts. Um, right. And, and the so. problem with books is, you know, I, and yes, I sell courses. So this could very well come across. Oh, you just want, I don't care. I don't care. Go do whatever you want with your money. But if you think that you can go to Amazon, pick up some trading book for 15 bucks, read that book, and then all of a sudden you're going to be making all kinds of money. You know, you're in for a rude awakening. The reason books are just total crap is because that author straight up 
can cherry pick from thousands upon thousands of charts or whatever he's trying to teach or she is trying to teach, and they'll just put them in there that fit oh so nice within their examples. Then you get out in the real trading world and mm-hmm. there's bullets flying. There's, you know, I've said it before, Graham is getting run over by a bus. We, nobody <laughs> knows what's going on. And you're like, well, this, in this book, this, it's, and then, so like I said, if you, if you don't believe me, fine, go read some books and then go out there and start trading with real money and, uh, you know, give me some feedback on uh, if you can, you know, all of a sudden become super successful by, by reading a $15 book. <laughs> you have to do something. And what Steve is saying is you got to watch how charts unfold. You need somebody that's going to show you, hey, Things go wrong. Let's take a look at what happens when things go wrong and how you can adapt to that. And, you know, that's that's the key point and, you know, how people are going to learn is just seeing, you know, when grandma's getting run over by the bus, that's what's going to separate the real trader from the, you know, the, the book reader traders where they've just been, uh, you know, seeing cherry picked examples of, of perfect things over and over again. So, yeah, real good point there. Um, do you, I'm just curious, do you try to incorporate that kind of philosophy in your teaching or are you just straight out of a textbook type teacher? Oh no, I do a lot of hands-on stuff. So I, I try to, I try to, um, well, you know. So back to the education discussion, I try to make it worth people's while to to sit in the classroom and you know spend a couple hours of their week. Um, they need to to be thinking through things and talking, and and so I, I have a real active classroom. Well, and also, how much? I maybe you might not, but you said or you uh, when we were talking previously, you said you teach grad grad students, mm-hmm. right? Yep. So, uh, out of, off the top of your head, estimate. Uh, you know, be conservative. What what sort of prices are these grad students paying for this class? Oh, uh, gosh, I. You know, that's a that's a good question. I um, I don't know. I so there's a state university in New Mexico. It's probably one of the the better bargains out there. They're probably paying. Uh, oh, I don't know, a thousand bucks a class. I would guess. All right. That's so in other words, right. yeah. so for one class, a thousand yeah. bucks. So yeah, you definitely want to make it worth your time from yeah. a monetary perspective too. So, um, but yeah, just well, I, yeah. I mean, too, they're they're going to be out there in the world. I mean, they they for the most part, the society still accepts degrees, you know, as as a, a, a bridge you have to cross. So so maybe it doesn't really um, doesn't matter what you're doing in the classroom, you know, just on some level. But uh, I, my idea is that they should be getting tools to then do what they're going to be doing later on. And that's the whole, mostly the whole reason why uh, students choose, you know, doing, to get a, say, a master's degree in economics. They want, they want those tools. And it's, it's my job, at least, to try to provide them something no, practical. I, I like that attitude. That's, uh, you're, you're serving your students well. And for any of your students listening, bring him an apple someday, okay? He deserves it. <laughs> so, all right, let's get back on track. I'm veering way off topic here. So, you joined the inner circle, and you know how did that go from there? Did I mean a lot of people hop in, and then they're seeing alerts? And I mean, were you just did you start throwing darts at alerts, or you know how did that whole experience yeah. go when you first jumped in? Well, I, I'm definitely, um, I mean, I'm risk averse, but at the same time, I I think I learn by doing. So um, I I tried, I probably tried just to see. Um, you know what I could do with some alerts. I, I did that a little bit, and I, I wasn't very successful with that. I'd say because I didn't really know. I said still at that point I didn't really know um, how to interpret alerts. I, that was with like very very little knowledge at all. Um, you know, I, I sort of learned a little bit learning by doing. Um, I mean, so I know then when, I always seem to get into that discussion of the paper trading. But for me, I, I've always found that small sums um, and actually. You know, trading with small sums at first uh, seems to be helpful to kind of learn the me- the, the mechanisms. Why do you yeah. think that is from an ep- economics perspective? I'm assuming there's you're you're oh, yeah. introducing incentives into the process, right? And yeah. is that kind of where? But oh, totally. So I mean, there, there's a whole whole thing on like game theories uh, and, and and things like that where where um, you're willing to take on gambles. I mean, if there's no monetary gain on a uh, gain on a gamble, um, then your incentives are going to be tons different than if there's actually money on the line. So there's a whole and then, okay, there's a whole uh, s- economic research is like a whole area called experimental economics, where they bring people into a, a laboratory setting and try to see how they behave in certain certain scenarios. Um, if you don't give them actual true sums of money to to work with, then you're not going to get true results. I mean, the research. You can't publish a paper if you're basically if you're paper trading in an economics laboratory because people know that those um, your incentives are off. So there probably is some scientific evidence that paper trading is is not 
that beneficial to knowing how you're going to behave when the market's live. You, the one the one good thing though, just real quick, the, on the paper trading is that I think you learned some of the mechanics in terms of how to how to do it, execute trades. That's probably really helpful. But and, um, and just uh, before I forget to make this point, because yeah. you, you used a crucial word, uh, one word, but crucial. You said small sums of money when yeah. you first were getting started. So yes, Steve, and that's saying, well, from an economics, perf- you know, scientific research says that you go out there and you throw massive amounts of money when you first get. No, he said small sums of money because that therefore brings on incentives into the process. So um, yeah, that's super interesting. And and by all means, any sort of research that you know from economics yeah. throughout the course of this interview, bring it up because. I mean, this is, we haven't had anything like that. And I, that's, that's super interesting that, um, and Chez, Chez has something to say. He's, he's excited. Well, I, I like, I completely agree with what Steven's saying because, you know, the small amounts of money will still evoke your brain to start screaming at you. All those voices we talk about in all these podcasts will come screaming out where if you're paper trading, you know, you're not going to get that response. You know, your body just won't get that response, no matter how, diff- how, how much you try. Um, the, the benefit of paper trading, um, in my opinion still is like, like you said, you know, getting the mechanics down, but more so finding the strategy that you feel strongest. Um, and then you put that, you can put the small amounts of money on the line, but, um, but yeah, there's, there's, I, I have no problem at all with, you know, people doing it small. The problem most people do have though, is they definitely, you know, they might start small for a trade or two and then it's time to like size up and, you know, like, all right, I got 25% of my account in one trade now. And then, you you know, you take a catastrophic loss. So yeah, if you can keep it small, I, I'd agree. That's a, that's a good way to start and there's nothing wrong with that at all. I wonder if there's some way to incentivize paper trading where, you know, you maybe it's like uh, through a game or something, um, you know, where you actually post your results. People see what you're doing. So you have some social pressure then to, to succeed. You know what I mean? So like video games are pretty successful. People really go all out for a video game, but there's no um, there's nothing economic on the line there. But there's this sort of social benefit of of having done well. So I, I kind of I've thought about that before. How could you... Um, maybe market some kind of game for paper trading. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something with, you know, it, just to keep people, you know, you know, it, you everyone can see what you've done right yeah. and what you've done wrong, you know, you are responsible and it's apparent and everybody can see it. But yeah, it's funny you mentioned that too cuz that's similar to kind of I'll, I'll only go off topic slightly here. You know, things there's like a navigation app called Waze and it rewards people for posting if there's a cop on the side of the road or an accident and it yeah. rewards people for, you know, just alerting other drivers and, you know, people enjoy using a GPS. It just makes me laugh. You know, nobody cares about a GPS normally, but if you give them rewards and incentives, they're totally, you know, more likely to use it. Yeah. But, um, but I'll get back on topic here, Clay. I, you know, Clay, you're really, no, no, I want to chime in on the incentive because I have something <laughs> yeah. to contribute here. Uh, Steve and I were talking how life is all one thing of economics. So, um, in the falls, uh, I play, uh, well, I don't really play. I'm more so coached now a, a co-ed softball team and we have a couple practices and the last, you know, everybody goes and bats and then, you know, the last swing, um, you know, they, they run it out and it becomes kind of a live setting. And I say, all right, anybody that makes an error here, you have to run, you know, some, you have to run. And it's amazing, you know, when, when, when there's no threat, when there's no incentive, on the line, people are kind yeah. of just goofing around, whatever, you mm-hmm. know, balls are going between people's legs. And I, but as soon as everybody knows, all right, last batter up, okay, if you screw up, you're running. Wow, you should see some of the plays that people are making. I mean, they're going all out. But why is that the case? Because there's incentive on the line. People don't want to run for the sake of just running. So um, I have no idea how we got here, but this is a fast, I mean, <laughs> yeah, no, trading, it, right? Yeah, we got to yeah. try to introduce, introduce uh, incentive into paper trading. So Steve, yeah. I want to collaborate on any sort of business move you make, if you can figure out some video <laughs> game or something, because that's, I mean, I don't know how you can really do it, but that's, that's truly the key but is uh, incentives. Don't, Go for don't it. We need, don't we need those folks out there, though, that, that are um, not paper trading and they're just, you know, the newbies? Don't we need oh, them in the market, you know? They're they will, they will the good. food source, yeah, the food source yeah. will always be there. I don't think we got to worry about that. We'll, we'll be okay in that. There so. are all people right, listening good. right now okay. thinking, look at these, this is all stage, bunch of con artists. They just want... Steve's getting paid if he can sell people Clay's court. I mean, there's plenty of people out there thinking like yeah. that right now. And don't worry, they'll learn the hard way. So they're, they're, yeah, they're always going to sure. be out there. But uh, yeah. yeah, I don't even know where we were going to go with this. You got a question I, for him, Chez? I, yeah, I, I do. I know where we're yes. going to go. All right, good. I, good. I, I, keep I'm getting, I keep this podcast on you do. Your track. You do. That's I'm, what, I'm the spaz my, one. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so, so you know, you're in here. You're learning. You know, you're putting small amounts of money on the line. How is that going at first? Are you, are you winning small, losing small? Are you finding yeah, success or not so much? 
I'm I'm finding a little bit of success now. Um, I'm still I still am going a little bit small, and um, and part of the reason is because I still feel like I'm learning, and I I'm, uh, I'm really getting into the the options trading now. It's sort of my my main vehicle. You're probably going to ask me that later, but that that, that was uh, that's sort of my main thing, and I want to really kind of feel get a feel for that. Um, also, I uh, I think I'm just by default. I, I my life situation right now. I I don't have that much cash for this um, thing, but I in the kind of in the near maybe near future I, I might have a little bit more available to to um, do some stuff with I, I mean I kind of like clay I, I also invest in some real estate so um, not so I don't know I, I think I'm gonna have some more f- funds available and um, so I feel like I'm still getting down my uh, my strategies and and feeling increasing my confidence um, and man clay trader uh, approaches it is the education and, and sort of the, the social part of it, I think, is really helpful for me um, to, to do that. So, uh, so I, yeah, I'm not being paid to, to say anything, but I do, at the same time, I got to plug Clay Trader a little bit. Just, yes, you are a little scam artist. This yeah, is all oh, a yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, But I, you bring up a good point, I, and I would argue it's actually a plus. There's nothing worse when I see people email me and say, hey, I got $15,000. Is this enough to get started in trading? And my re- reply back is always, wow, that, that's way too much. Uh, I think yeah. it's better to start yep. small. And for, I mean, go get a job. Go get a part-time job. Go get a couple. Who cares yeah. if you don't have a lot? You don't want a lot because you're going to lose it all. But if you start yeah. small, then think about what's happening. You're starting small. Sure, you're winning a little bit, losing a little bit, but you're starting small. But remember you remember the context. You have a job. So if you're being smart with your money, now if you're going out and you know drinking beer every night, well, then you know your budget's not going to look so good. But if you're starting small, learning, your bank account is going to continue to grow, mm-hmm. continue to grow. And while you're learning, your bank account is growing and growing. So then after you've, you've learned, you've been practicing small, hey, look, I have this money. Now maybe I have 15000 Hey, now I'm, I'm actually ready to start to scale things up. So I think it's a perfect situation when people are small and then they can scale up relative to, hey, Clay, yeah. I got $20,000. Is this enough? You know, I, I can't avoid the pattern day trading rule. Whoa, buddy. 20,000, yep. 50, even 5,000. I, I get scared when I see new people yeah. saying, I'm going to start with $5,000. I mean, right. um, it's so, yeah, I think that's right. perfect that you're starting small. I mean, I, I think something you, you've said in the past, I don't think I've heard you say it lately, but um, it really helped me was that the stock market's always going to be there. You know, like you're sort of this feeling like, oh, I got to hurry up and invest because, you know, Tesla's about to go up, you know, or whatever it is. So you, you feel like, oh, I have to put that money out there. But, the stock the the stock market is going to be there the next day, and if you have the the right tools, um, you can you can play in any kind of market that's out there, which is just so awesome. You know, I I never really thought that I would uh, um, would bet against stocks. You know, I, going short or whatever. It, you know, I, I I was always that guy that was kind of like, you know, that shouldn't that shouldn't be allowed, or you know, that's that's messing things up. But I mean. That's my maybe my go-to strategy now. So well, let me ask this from an economics perspective. I've always looked at it. Doesn't that bring equilibrium to the market? Oh yeah, it, it really does. In fact, I, I, you said that at one point um, earlier on when I was first in there, and, and that that's definitely something that I was like. Oh yeah, that makes total sense. I never really given it a good uh, long view perspective. I was sort of biased on on long positions. One, basically, my I'm really interested in startup companies. I mean, in, just from a from a personal point of view, I think that startup companies are really cool. Not from necessarily a trading perspective. So I was kind of when I did get into trading, that was sort of my mentality that oh, um, I want to see you know companies just go and get to be successful. But obviously, I mean, it, it's it's sort of a different it's it's a different um, thing that's happening in a market, and so we're here to make money. I mean, we're not. It, that's the point. So. Right. And I mean, the other way for people that maybe struggle with shorting is I look at it like this too. Look, if a, if a company is small or, or whatever, any company and you're mm-hmm. shorting, you're thinking, no, I think your company's crap. I think you're a bad CEO. I think yeah. this, that, or the other, and you're wrong. Guess what happens? In order for you yeah. to get out of the position, you have to buy. Right. So if companies have a problem with people thinking that they're garbage, hey, if you prove those people wrong, they mm-hmm. got to come back and buy your stock, which is you know what happened yep. with Tesla. There's a massive short squeeze on that. Uh, mm-hmm. I remember Crocs, those little sandal things back in the day. Mm-hmm. That thing went on a massive short squeeze. So yep. that, that's another way that you know yeah. it's kind of justified is, hey, 
prove them wrong. And if, if you yeah. prove them wrong, they got to buy because that's the, that's how you get out of a short position. Exactly. Yeah. That, that right there, that, um, that what you just said, and, and you had said it before, it really, um, put some light bulbs on, uh, for me, uh, when I heard that. And, and I, I kind of like you, I mean, I find that, uh, well, I don't know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm speaking for you, but I think I've heard you say that the, um, and going short is actually a bit, they're easier for me to play. I don't know. I, I just, some reason the pattern is, it clicks with me more or something. Yeah, that, that's why. And that's also why he was like, I have the strategy for you. How do you mm-hmm. know? How do you know that yeah. person's mental mindset? How do you know that person's yeah. psychology? Some people are not good at going long. Some people are not go- good at going short. I mean, mm-hmm. there's, uh, you know, all sorts of psychological makeup. Yeah. That's why you got to teach people the broad tools. Right. And then, you know, they got to come up with, uh, I can't remember, Chez, maybe you, DS. I think that was episode 10 where he was just, uh, he spent tons of time finding what works for him. Um, and you know, it, it's going to be a case by case basis, but yeah. let's get back to kind of more of your sure. journey. So you got uh-huh. into options. Did you ever venture into penny stocks at all or, and what oh, type yeah. of options did you, are you, are you looking at? <laughs> okay. So let's do the penny stock thing first. I, I did. Yeah. So, um, one of the tools I had when I was really, um, obsessed with plug power and you might call it an obsession to some degree. I was like, you know, looking at it all the time. Like I, I've got to, I want to see what plug power does. I, I went into the, um, the Yahoo chat. I don't know if you've ever done that, the Yahoo Financial chat rooms. and uh, uh, I know I've been on their message boards. Yeah, the, basically the message board, you know, essentially. And um, uh, I'm not really, I maybe I'm not that social media savvy, but I, I was in there and uh, someone tipped me off onto um, a company. Uh-oh, com- Yeah, That's exactly. Pick. Here we go exactly. from the message board. <laughs> So I went to uh, Ambus. I don't know if you've uh, AMBS, some, right? AMBS, yeah. I remember that. And one. I, I used there used to be a guy in uh, in your um, in your room who talked about it a lot, and I don't see him around anymore. So I don't <laughs> he know. I went down with the ship, huh? Didn't yeah, maybe, to maybe so. And uh, yeah, so I was in with Ambus a little bit, and man, they were going to go to the moon, and uh, I don't know what happened. They're they're still below ten cents. Actually, no, I think they just I just checked them recently because I wanted to see you know what some of these early ones I had looked at were doing and uh, before this talk and uh, they actually are um, they were able to get onto the Nasdaq. So I, I guess uh, they they didn't go up, but they had to basically buy back a bunch of shares. So they're still be- they're below what I had paid you know uh, initially. So I I, yeah, yeah, that's good. I mean, that was like, oh, that's over, been over a year. It's like, um, you know, so I, I lost some cash there too. I'm not going to lie. I, th- I, think that's a, I think that's a good segment into this question here though. Mm-hmm. So, so let me hear about, you know, how did it feel to take a loss? I know you'd found some success right away, right, yeah. when you had started trading. But how did it feel to take a loss at that time when you did take a loss versus kind of, you know, taking a loss in some of your trades now? Um. Oh, back then? Okay. So, oh, yeah. No, it was pretty discouraging back then. In fact, um, I had told my sister, she's, a, uh, she's an immunologist. I hope she listens to this someday. A what? She's, a, she's an immunologist. What's she's that? A, she's a, uh, has a PhD in uh, biochemistry. And oh, she, okay. So she's not she's, a very smart person then, huh? <laughs> she, she's way smarter than I am. And uh, she, uh, she's a professor or she's a researcher at uh, Washington University in St. Louis. Um, and uh, I told her about this Ambus because they're they're a biotech company, and uh, I think one of their researchers actually is at uh, WashU. So she she even uh, you know could have been on the ship with me, but she was just like kind of laughing at my approach to, to to investing. And then uh, when when she actually saw that these things went down, and she of course reached out to me and, and let me know that I was an idiot. So for me, it's more personal, <laughs> those are initial ones. And, uh, and it was discouraging, you know, cause I had, I had talked him up and, you know, I was confident, um, here I, I am, I have a PhD in economics, you know, it was, it was a morale. Yeah, economists aren't supposed to lose. Yeah, exactly. That was a morale decayer. I don't know what you would call that. Um, so yeah, so back, back then, yeah, it was more, um, it was more dis- discouraging, but Geez, now, I mean, I don't, I'm never going to, I can say it. I never will lose my shirt like that, you know, like, because I have, I have a system in place. And so, yeah, I I may have small, small losers um, and it's not that big of a deal. And uh, yeah, and sometimes it happens multiple times in a row, um, but it's, gosh, it's nice to not see a, a bleed out of your account. It's not that big of a deal. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, people it, are thinking, what are you talking about? You just lost money, but you said it's not that big. Yeah. What? Why? Why isn't it not that big of a deal? Well, I have the the tools in place to know um, that I have like basically like a a safety net. You know, you're you're not going to. Uh, I guess safety net's not really the right word to use for financial, you know, your financial safety net. But I mean, like, I, I you have, have a risk. A, fina- you have a risk safety net. Yeah, exactly. So I have some insurance. I mean, the, the stop losses. I set my stop losses. I mean, that that's the, that's what it comes down to. I realized how important those were, and uh, you know, I, I don't let my losers get very big. Explain the economics of a stop loss. Why is that a good decision within a plan? You know, what's you know, what, why is why yeah. does that make so much sense? Break it down for us, economist. Okay, so let me let me think how I would explain that. I guess um, from a psychological point of view, you are uh, you are trying to minimize um, the hurt that's going to happen to you. So you buy insurance essentially, and so um, knowing that there's a potential for something great to happen, also or something something positive to happen. Um, I'm not saying I'm looking to sh- go to the moon every time or anything like that, but I'm saying that there's something positive that could happen. But you should always have some insurance to back you up. I mean, we we drive our cars, um, and we, you know, I enjoy driving my electric car, but I pay a little bit for insurance just in case, um, you know, I wreck the car. Or my wife, she loves to, to gun that thing. Um, she she wrecks that. We know the, the losses are limited. I mean, insurance is a very typical thing that we do every day in life. So I, I think of it as insurance, I guess. No, that's, that's beautifully said. I mean, we, if you uh, own a house or own a car, you better have a stop loss on that uh, asset. And your stop loss, like Steve said, is actually just called your insurance. It's- so, yeah, let me tell you, I did have a, a, a loss in a, in a uh, property I own. My dad and I bought a, uh, um, a little condo in downtown Albuquerque a while back. And uh, I lived there. My wife and I lived there. It was like a 600 square foot place in an old high school, old Albuquerque high school. In fact, um, it's uh, it's on a it's our place is in the original gymnasium of the school. It's on the like a second level uh, gymnasium, and our floors were the original maple wood basketball floors, and just really really beautiful place. Um, and the uh, last year, last spring, actually around the time, um, I guess that plug power was going down. Uh, the guy in, on top of us, his toilet broke and uh, we had like two inches of water in oh. our, our unit. And But you know, I didn't sweat it. They called me and told me. It's like, well, we have insurance and actually uh, in that case, they you know redid the whole interior of my, my unit. So that's the same thing as a stop loss. Yeah, no, it, it really is. It's uh, it's just an incentive to not uh, send yourself out to live in a cardboard box is essentially what's, yeah. what's going on with all that within trading. So as it stands right now, uh, what are some of your strengths, that you, some things that you think you do very well? What are some things that you think you probably still need to work on? Um, I think I'm, I'm starting to, to do a lot better with um, to, to, to find good entry points and see them ahead of time. Um, and so I, I, and I think I do that well and I, I can s- get into a good point where I can set, um, some trades and then go teach my economics classes or, you know, uh, spend time in my office without having to check things all the time. So I think I'm getting good at that. Um, I, I think a while back I s- said this, I, I think maybe even with Chaz, I don't know if you remember, we were chatting and I had said that one of my goals is to be able to say, set like 10 trades, or so, and then um, and then kind of let them play out without me having to check them all the time. Um, like on, maybe on an, on an evening, you know, you set set several trades, and then and then kind of let them like a swing trade happen. Um, so I, I I'm still kind of figuring that strategy out, and and I, but I so I what I'm doing to get there is um, just really concentrating on a couple of of trades on a day. All right now, um, that's that's basically my approach to to really build up my confidence. Now you said you're still working your way through the advanced options course, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, I am. That's like twenty yeah. some hours of, of coursework. Right, right. It's it's definitely. I think it's it is the longest course um, that Clay has yeah. put out. But I I want to you know I'm so happy you mentioned that because I actually have eleven positions on right now, oh, and you know awesome. it's totally possible once mm-hmm. you get through the course. I think it's really going to open up your doors in that sense of cool. you know you might only need to take a half hour during lunch or something to kind of check mm-hmm. on it. It's it's really great for that. Um, but um, you know, are you using right now with kind of the strategies you are applying? Are you using uh, any technical indicators, or you know what? What you are you pattern playing it? What's uh, what's your strategy right now? 
Okay, so um, uh, so maybe it, okay. This is a good. This is a, actually a good question for me because I use a lot of things. So one of maybe one of the things I need to do is narrow down what I use. But I I definitely use. Um, I look at the patterns and I I I try to do the. I use RVR quite a bit, um, kind of knowing, um, uh, you know, where I can do have a good entry based on past the past chart. And uh, um, I think what what else helps me is uh, uh, knowing about things being overextended or not. I, I, I that um, has been a big big thing I've used lately um, that helps me out a lot. Um, how overextended something is. So you're looking um, for rubber bands a lot, then, huh? Yeah, exactly. Right, right. And uh, uh, cliff points. I mean, that's sort of my. <laughs> I just find cliff points so straightforward, and and I don't. I want to. Say, I'm almost saying the word easy, but I just like that. It's simple, simpler for me. Just to simple things like that. They're efficient, right? Efficient? Yeah, e- efficient. There you go. Yeah, because I don't need something to. You know, I don't need complication. Uh, essentially, I want to try to find the most efficient approach to getting the job done, and and so these sort of basic guys, just sort of basic things, and and looking at charts a bunch of times helps. Um, uh, that's helped me a lot. And I, I think uh, you know, just knowing kind of what a, a candlestick you know is doing. I mean, you can really convince yourself that you understand these candlesticks, but I think um, over time you really you start to really understand them, and I, I think I'm getting to that that point where you know like um you just see a wolf candle and you kind of know for sure that that's a wolf candle um that so i think looking at candles helps a lot um uh i don't know i i don't know if i'm answering your question really well oh, no no you totally are you totally are if you weren't i would have uh <laughs> cut you off and said hey let's talk about something where you can actually answer the question but no that was uh that, that makes perfect sense so you're you're clearly you got some things you're working on you got some yep. things that you uh are getting I, I like to hear you know you're feeling better and better with candlesticks because yeah, that, those are for sure something that uh, that takes a little bit. To, I mean, they're very simplistic, yeah. but there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle. Like I always say, you know, charting is a bunch of small little simple pieces, mm-hmm. but you just got to put them all together and learn how they all interact uh, with one another. Yeah. So big question here, uh-huh. uh, favorite one. Um, Chez has a time machine, and if he were to lend that to you, and you could go back in time when you uh, you know were first getting started, what bit of advice would you give yourself? Uh, I I would tell myself that um uh gosh I'm just I I'm just picturing that day of plug just you know shot straight up I and mean, there was there's probably a huge upper shadow on that day you'll it, it's so easy to see it there and um to to know that there are certain indicators that tell you things are at least taking a breath you know and you got to you got to be willing to take some money off the table um uh Take your profits. Basically, that was my problem. I didn't know how to, to take profits, so uh, that would be my advice. Like, don't don't just put all your eggs in one basket. Um, take some profits, and and then things are always going to have breathers. That's a big thing. Breathers to me make a lot of sense, especially if you have a, a one that's running, like you know, a plug or at what it was at that point, or, or Tesla, um, Apple. I mean, those things all take breaths. Yeah, you know, I I honestly don't sell any of my uh, stocks or options unless they move about a thousand percent. So that's that's always my reasonable target. You know, emphasis on the word reasonable. But um, Steve, it's been absolutely awesome having you on. It's been a great conversation. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna ask you some fun questions now. Okay. And the one that makes the uh, the one that will determine if you you know can remain a member of this community or not will be uh, what is your favorite movie? Now I want I want to I think I'm gonna guess for Steven. Pick a something be- obscure, a, please. A beautiful pick something mind. Obscure. Is that your favorite movie? Oh, I do like that movie, but that wasn't what I was thinking. Crap. Um, yeah, so it's funny. I don't know if you. Uh, well, I know Clay has kids, but I don't just don't see movies as much anymore. Um, but uh, uh, I do. I do watch movies, and I'm you know I'm learning trading and all this stuff. So I'm not as I'm not as in the entertainment. I'm not up to date, up to date on entertainment. But one of my all time favorite movies is Back to the Future. McFly. <laughs> yeah, that does, that I, I love count, that movie. I've but. watched that thing t- dozens of times. So, uh, in fact, I might watch it this weekend. I have a confession to make. I've never seen that movie, and every you time I say that, that yeah, every time I say that, oh my dude, yeah, I'm, I'm going to watch it though. Maybe I'll, uh, maybe my wife and I will try to watch it this weekend oh, or something. Try. You've got, you've got to watch. It. I know everybody the, says that they look at me like I'm a communist as soon as I, and maybe I am. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, well, I, uh, I. I say um, there's one line in that I always say um, to my kids. It's hello McFly, you know, 
that's like pop pop culture. That that makes me happy that I'm I know that and you don't. So that's I, you know what that makes me happy because I used to watch that probably once a week as a kid. Yeah, and and Clay, you're just I'm disappointed. No, in you, no here, the honest question here though. Am I going to be disappointed because the bar is set so high, no, or is it no, still going to no? You will not. I, you I will don't. Not. Wa- I don't rewatch movies very much, but I um I watch Back to the Future like. Yeah, and I, I oh, multiple times, and I still get kind of like nervous. Like, is it going to work out for Marty McFly? You know, and I know that there's so, like more episodes with him in it. So you're, so you're telling me, Arch, that the law of diminishing returns does not apply to Back to the Future? I, I'm. That's what I'm telling you. I guess that's wow. That's that's huge. Because I mean, I mean, it must r- decline a little bit, but I, uh, it's. I'm going to watch it again and see see what my. <laughs> I think I'm going to watch uh, it again uh, today, just because. Yeah, yeah I haven't maybe, watched maybe it in I'll a try to years. find it. And maybe uh, well, my wife and I can do that for date night tonight. So uh, I just heard an interview by the from one of the the co-producers or directors. I don't know who he was, but they were asking him about um, a remake of Back to the Future, and he's like. Because uh, they're doing a remake, that's the big thing right now, I guess. Remakes. Right, right. Yeah. Um, his he has really fought against that, and he said um, that he he's basically they will never be able to do it while he's alive, and he's trying to set it up with his estate that they can't do it once he's gone too, um, because people want to people love that movie, so they want to try to to redo it. But how can you redo something that's just a masterpiece? Like yeah, that? I'm definitely gonna watch it because this is ridiculous. This is I almost got a about. DeLorean at 16 years old, Clay, because <laughs> I'm not joking either. I went. He doesn't even know what it. a DeLorean is. Yeah. He hasn't seen the movie. <laughs> Un- unreal, unreal. I do know what it is, which tells me that movie is super epic. If I know what this car is from yeah. a movie that I've never seen, so it, it's definitely influential. Yeah. What about your favorite meal though? And you um, can't say green chili because I know you're out in New Mexico. Well, I grow green chili, so I have a I have a um, a huge garden right now, and lots of green chili grow, growing. And uh, so I, it is my favorite food, like a green chili burrito. Man, you can't can't go wrong with that. Um, okay, so other than that, like, man, we eat those like three times a week, so it's it's hard to say. Um, I love uh, Indian food too, so um, like like a tiki masala. So um, you know, that's, you can't get a good tiki masala in Las Cruces, New Mexico. So sorry. To, yeah, sorry. I was just going to say, I, you, you might not be the best location for that, but, um, you could always try. There's some, always somebody who's going to try, but, um, yeah. do you have a favorite dessert you top that off with? Oh yeah. Cherry pie. I just made a cherry pie. Actually, I'm a, uh, I, my son and I cooked up a cherry pie fresh uh, with fresh cherries just, um, two nights ago. So that's my, my favorite dessert. Nice. That it's hard to go wrong with that. What about uh, music, song, band? I mean, let's try to stay away from the the girl pop groups. But I mean, Ariana Jeez. Grande. Let's you know. So, man, because I can't answer these quickly, um, you're gonna that might be scaling me down in terms of the the cool factor. So uh, you're an economist. Know. It doesn't get any cooler than that, man. Trust me. Yep. You're you're at the peak of the mountain. The other night, I I was uh, kind of going back to my old favorites, and I I was kids were all in bed. And um, I was just up, you know, enjoying a, a small glass of wine. And uh, I was listening to uh, Pearl Jam and uh, Metallica. Um, and I was thinking, man, these are some classics that I just love. So I, I really like those. Now that I'm a bit older, um, I, I, you know, I like something, stuff that's a little more chill, um, you know, with the family. We listen to a lot of things like Stevie Wonder, um, who I saw live in Stockholm a few years ago, which is an awesome show. So, you know, I'm kind of all over the place. I thought you were going to say, when you said more chill, I thought, and like more relaxed, I thought you were going to say like Tupac and Notorious just B.I.G. and stuff like that. But I, oh, I guess, yeah, not, yeah not you went that. in a little you know, different would, direction there. Right. What about uh, fun or hobbies? Oh, um, I definitely, uh, I love being out in the yard. I've got my, uh, my garden, my, uh, just finished, uh, chicken coop, uh, my six, uh, hens are in there. Um, you know, I like being out there with my kids and, uh, doing fun stuff like that. So yeah, gardening is my big thing. We go up to the mountains just to kind of cool off about two hours from here. You can get a 25 degree cooler temps. Um, so it's something we do quite a bit this time of year. Great, great. Now, uh, if you could meet one person dead or alive, who would it be? Uh, you know, the first thing that came to my head, Martin Luther King. I don't know. I'm just a uh, big Martin Luther King fan. So there you go. That's a good answer. That's a good answer. And our final question here, I'm limiting you to three words. So use those three words to describe what you would say are associated with a successful trader. Um, patience. Uh, Let's see. Okay, so the patience is the first one. Um, relaxed. 
I like that. I like that and, a lot. Uh, and knowledge. Oh, good. Relax and knowledge. Those are two uh, two new ones. So I, I think, uh, and if you read some of the stuff, you know, uh, uh, I think traders, um, even from like a health perspective, there's some 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 things people should watch out for. Like, you know, it's good to make sure you go get exercise and you know get up and move around. So that's the relaxation part. I, I guess I'm I'm thinking about. It's like you don't want to just get too stressed about the how things are going to go or how you're going to do your trades. It's good to to kind of keep it light and and relaxed. So. I fully agree. Well, hey man, I I, I honestly I, I I could keep talking and we have so many cool people in the community. It's it's amazing. You know, last episode we're talking to some guy from Norway. Now we're talking to an economist, and I could keep on talking and talking, but. Uh, th- and today I know you said was your day off, so thank you, uh, genuinely thank you for taking time out of your day sure. uh, to hang out and talk with us. My pleasure. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun with you guys. Good, good. Well, if you enjoyed today's podcast, I'd like for you to do a couple things. If you are listening to this on claytrader.com, leave us a comment. I'm sure Steve would be more than willing to answer any questions you have for him. Ches and I also read all those comments. There's a share button on that page too, so if, uh, if you found this worthwhile, please uh Click that. If you're listening on iTunes, then leave us a rating. Uh, you know, I'd like to try to get up to 100 ratings. I think last time I checked, we're right around the 60 range. Uh, so if you if you find these helpful and want us to, to keep recording them, uh, then you know, leave us a rating, give us some feedback, and like I said, Ches and I we read all those and we uh, we take everything that uh, you know people say seriously, and you know we want to make this uh, the most efficient and practical uh, you know podcast as possible. So thank you everybody again for uh, hanging out with us, and we will see you back for the next episode. This has been the Stock Trading Reality Podcast. Thanks for taking the time to hang out. To learn more about Clay and the Clay Trader community, including the trading team, premium training, and more, visit claytrader.com.